Welcome to the Dread Familiar. Fear is the relinquishment of logic, the willing relinquishing of reasonable patterns. We yield to it, or we fight it, but we cannot meet it halfway. Shirley Jackson, The Haunting of Hill House. Thank you to everyone joining me tonight, and a special thank you to anyone who has submitted a story or a voice audition. As always, if you'd like to be featured on the show, send your stories and voices to submissions at thedreadfamiliar.com. Tonight I'm going to try something new and share with you one and a half stories. The first is a new work, and the second is one half of a classic. The other half will be read in the next episode. This allows me to share some longer stories, and I hope you enjoy the slight shift in format. Let me know if you have any feedback. You can reach me by going to thedreadfamiliar.com or at the Dread Familiar on Facebook and Instagram. Also, don't forget to check out the other great horror content on the Legion Podcasts Network. Tonight's first story is by Dylan Lowe. Dylan is a journalist and writer living in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. You can find him on Reddit at u slash Dylan is online and on Twitter at Dylan M. Lowe. Lowe is spelled L-O-W-E. This story skips right past the familiar setup and plunges straight into the insanity that grips the occupant of a house that was in the words of Shirley Jackson, born bad. This is Oblivion by Dylan Lowe. This house is trying to kill me. The walls are deafening, screaming, screeching, shrieking. The foundation growls beneath my feet. The house is hungry, and I am its meal. I rush from the master bedroom in a mad attempt to find the staircase. The hallway stretches at a pace faster than I can hope to run. Each time I manage to reach a corridor's end, a new corridor emerges where it has never been before. Walls shift before my eyes. I am lost in this maze with no familiar architecture to guide me. The lights flicker wildly and the temperature steadily climbs. I sweat profusely. Portraits that I have never seen before line the walls. Their eyes follow me as I run. They are alive and watching. Their painted faces scowl at me as if they wish to see me die just as much as the house does. There are ghosts in the walls. I can hear them laughing at me. The house is a cat toying with me. It's dying prey. Some twisted pathway leads me to the study, far from the staircase I am so desperately trying to find. The bookcases are rumbling violently. Papers that were once organized neatly atop the oaken desk in the center of the room now swirl about the air at ferocious velocity, carried by some sort of vortex. Books begin hurling themselves toward me from their shelves. I narrowly escape most of their impact, but one crashes brutally into my chest, cracking a rib, perhaps puncturing a lung. The rest viciously collide with the walls, chipping paint and leaving behind small hollows. Struggling for air, I stumble backward into the hallway. I again follow the corridor, wherever it may lead. Black vines now slither along the carpet, curling around my ankles as I move. I pass a number of unfamiliar doors, and although they are open, I see only darkness beyond their decrepit frames. I dare not enter. Once I reach the hall's turn, I hear them slam shut in unison behind me. The ghosts begin to cry, and the walls begin to weep. Salty tears dripping from ceilings to floorboards. The hallway now defies all logic. It seems to rotate as I run. At turns I am running along the walls and then the ceiling and then the floor once more. My head swims as I attempt to navigate the house's impossible geometry. I arrive at a bathroom. A revolting liquid, a kind of bile spews from the faucets and shower head, painting the once pristine walls with the color of death. 
The liquid is rapidly filling the room, spilling out into the hallway. It carries with it the foulest smell I have ever encountered, and I am overcome with nausea. I vomit into the murky substance and retreat back into the relative safety of the corridor, although safety may not truly exist here. I press on. Although there is no visible fire, a thick black smoke begins to fill the house, stinging my eyes. It was already difficult to properly breathe, but now it is nearly impossible. I cough and wheeze violently as I struggle onward. I keep moving corridor after corridor, but there is no end in sight. I arrive at a room I have never seen before. It is dimly lit and clocks of all shapes and sizes line the walls. Their ticking is so loud it reverberates in my skull. Tick, tock, tick, tock, tick, tock, tick, tock, tick, tock, tick, tock. On the far side of the room, I make out the faint outline of a window. The night sky's indigo hue shines through, just barely offering my only hope of deliverance. The window is the only exit I have been able to find. I dash toward it, and as I sprint, the hands of the clocks all strike midnight in eerie unison. It is as if the house is saying, you are out of time. We shall see. I resist the natural urge to slow down as I approach the window and throw the full weight of my body through the glass, prepared for whatever fall I may have to endure, as long as I will be free. I close my eyes as the glass shatters and I fall for what feels like an eternity. Eventually, though, I hit the ground. When I open my eyes, I find that I am once again in the master bedroom. The house has played yet another trick on me. I was a fool to believe that it would let me escape so easily. The fall has done significant damage. I fear that a bone in my right arm may have snapped in two. I am covered in shards of broken glass, slicing at my skin with even the subtlest movement. Thin red rivers of blood flow about the contours of my body, standing is excruciating, but I stand nonetheless, as I am left with little choice. I stumble toward the doorway. Upon reaching it, I am shocked to find the staircase leading down, 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 into total darkness, jutting directly from the bedroom's precipice. The steps may never end. I descend all the same. As I descend, the steps change in material. Where they were once wooden, they are now soft. With what little light I have been afforded, I see that they resemble flesh. They gush blood with each footstep. The staircase is a living thing, and it is swallowing me whole. I fear that I am only delving deeper into the house's gaping maw. As I venture farther and farther into the unknown, the temperature plummets to frigidity. It is impossible to tell how much time passes on my descent. Time is immaterial in this place. Minutes are days, our seconds are hours. I lack the strength to continue, yet I continue nevertheless, refusing to be devoured. I reach a black wall of bedrock. The staircase has a conclusion after all. The effort expended to reach the bottom of the steps has been in vain. There is no path forward. I wheeze as I attempt to catch my breath, fluid filling my lungs. I am running out of time. I turn around to retrace my steps, to ascend the infinite steps, only to find yet another wall of bedrock behind me, the staircase is gone. The house has ensnared me in its trap. I am a fly tangled in a spider's web, hopeless. I look up and see a faint dot of light, the doorway to the master bedroom. I know that I must reach it if I have any chance of survival. I must climb. As I reach for handholds in the bedrock, the light moves farther and farther away. I am sinking deeper and deeper into the belly of the beast. 
panic takes hold like never before. I desperately claw at the walls, searching for any possible path. My fingernails tear from their beds, and my fingers paint red streaks upon the bedrock with each futile attempt to scramble upward. The light grows fainter. At last, a boon. I find a handhold so thin that only my fingertips can grasp it. I pull myself upward, pain shooting down my broken arm. I find another, and another, and yet another. I make steady progress in spite of my agony. I climb up, up, up. After inching my way up hundreds if not thousands of minuscule ledges, I pause to look up and assess how far I have come. The light is gone. Above is only endless darkness. In a moment of unbridled frustration, I scream. The ghosts scream with me. Am I already one of the ghosts? Is that all I have been from the start? Just another of the house's victims trapped in its cycle of perpetual brutalities? There is no hope in attempting to make sense of this place. There is no hope at all. There never has been. Right? Hanging from my tiny ledge, I am at a loss. There is nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. I look down. The speck of light is now below me. I thought I was climbing up. 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 But have I really been climbing farther down? Down, 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 down. Have I gone anywhere at all? Space and time are illusions here, after all. Perhaps space and time have always been illusions. Perhaps I am only now able to see them for what they are. Forget it. Forget me. Forget hope. Forget reality. Forget truth. I've lost my will to stomach this carnage. The house will always triumph in the end. No use in combating it. I stare into the light. If I simply let go, perhaps I will fall directly into it. If the house is the essence of darkness, the light is surely its antithesis. I let my bloodied fingers slip from the ledge, and I fall. But I do not fall downward, not toward the light, no. I fall upward, toward the infinite blackness. I watch the light fading as I plummet, down, 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 or up. Toward oblivion. The next story is written by Edgar Allan Poe. Poe's stories are full of whining, depressed, and deeply unsettling characters. This one is no different. This story was written in four parts, and tonight I'll be reading parts one and two. Parts three and four will follow in the next episode. This is part one of William Wilson by Edgar Allan Poe. Let me call myself, for the present, William Wilson. That is not my real name. That name has already been the cause of the horror, of the anger, of my family. Have not the winds carried my name with my loss of honor to the ends of the earth? Am I not forever dead to the world, to its honors, to its flowers, to its golden hopes? And a cloud, heavy and endless, does it not hang forever between my hopes and heaven? Men usually become bad by degrees, but I let all goodness fall from me in a single moment as if I had dropped a coat. From small acts of darkness I passed in one great step into the blackest evil ever known. Listen while I tell of the one cause that made this happen. Death is near and its coming has softened my spirit. I desire, in passing through this dark valley, the understanding of other men. I wish them to believe that I have been, in some ways, in the power of forces beyond human control. I wish them to find for me, in the story I am about to tell, some small fact that proves I could have done only what I did. 
I would have them agree that what happened to me never happened to other men. Is it not true that no one has ever suffered as I do? Have I not indeed been living in a dream? And am I not now dying from the horror and the unanswered question, the mystery of the wildest dream ever dreamed on earth? I am one of a family well known for their busy minds. As a small child, I showed clearly that I too had the family character. As I became older, it grew more powerful in me. For many reasons, it became a cause of talk among friends, and the hurt it did me was great. I wanted people always to do things my way. I acted like a wild fool. I let my desires control me. My father and mother, weak in body and mind, could do little to hold me back. When their efforts failed, of course my will grew stronger. From then on, my voice in the house was law. At an age when few children are allowed to be free, I was left to be guided by my own desires. I became the master of my own actions. I remember my first school. It was in a large house about 300 years old, in a small town in England, among a great number of big trees. All of the houses there were very old. In truth, it was a dreamlike and spirit-quieting place, that old town. At this moment, I seemed to feel the pleasant coolness under the shade of the trees. I remember the sweetness of the flowers. I hear again with delight, I cannot explain, the deep sound of the church bell each hour, breaking the stillness of the day. It gives me pleasure to think about this school, as much pleasure, perhaps, as I am now able to experience. Deep in suffering as I am, suffering only too real, perhaps no one will object if for a short time I forget my troubles and tell a little about this period. Moreover, the period and place are important. It was then and there that I first saw, hanging over me, the terrible promise of things to come. Let me remember. The house where we boys lived and went to school was, as I have said, old and wide. The grounds about it were large, and there was a high wall around the outside of the whole school. Beyond this wall we went three times in each week, on one day to take short walks in the neighboring fields, and two times on Sunday to go to church. This was the one church in the village, and the head teacher of our school was also the head of the church. With a spirit of deep wonder and of doubt I used to watch him there. This man, with slow step and quiet, thoughtful face, in clothes so different and shining clean, could this be the same man who, with a hard face and clothes far from clean, stood ready to strike us if we did not follow the rules of the school? Oh, great and terrible question, beyond my small power to answer. I well remember our playground, which was behind the house. There were no trees, and the ground was as hard as stone. In front of the house there was a small garden, but we stepped into this garden only at very special times, such as when we first arrived at school, or when we left it for the last time, or perhaps when father or mother or a friend came to take us away for a few days. But the house! What a delightful old building it was! To me, truly a palace! There was really no end to it. I was not always able to say certainly which of its two floors I happened to be on. From each room to every other there were always three or four steps, either up or down. Then the rooms branched into each other, and these branches were too many to count, and often turned and came back upon themselves. Our ideas about the whole great house were not very far different from the thoughts we had about time without end. During the five years I was there, I could never have told anyone how to find the little room where I and some eighteen or twenty other boys slept. The schoolroom was the largest room in the house, and I couldn't help thinking it was the largest in the world. It was long and low, with pointed windows and heavy wood overhead. In a far corner was the office of our head teacher, Mr. Bransby. This office had a thick door, and we would rather have died than open it when he was not there. Inside the thick walls of this old school I passed my years from ten to fifteen, yet I always found it interesting, 
A child's mind does not need the outside world. In the quiet school, I found more bright pleasure than I found later as a young man in riches, or as an older man in wrongdoing. Yet I must have been different indeed from most boys. Few men remember much of their early life. My early days stand out as clear and plain as if they had been cut in gold. In truth, the hotness of my character and my desire to lead and command soon separated me from the others. Slowly I gained control over all who were not greatly older than myself, over all except one. This exception was a boy who, though not of my family, had the same name as my own, William Wilson. This boy was the only one who ever dared to say he did not believe all I told him, and who would not follow my commands. This troubled me greatly. I tried to make the others think that I didn't care. The truth was that I felt afraid of him. I had to fight to appear equal with him but he easily kept himself equal with me. Yet no one else felt, as I did, that this proved him the better of the two. Indeed, no one else saw the battle going on between us. All his attempts to stop me in what I wanted to do were made when no one else could see or hear us. He did not desire, as I did, to lead the other boys. He seemed only to want to hold me back. Sometimes, with wonder and always without pleasure, I saw that his manner seemed to show a kind of love for me. I did not feel thankful for this. I thought it meant only that he thought himself to be very fine indeed, better than me. Perhaps it was this love he showed for me, added to the fact that we had the same name, and also that we had entered the school on the same day, which made people say that we were brothers. Wilson did not belong to my family, even very distantly. But if we had been brothers, we would have been near to each other indeed, for I learned that we were both born on the 19th of January, 1809. This seemed a strange and wonderful thing. Part 2 In the first part of my story, I spoke about my life at my first school, and about the other boys over whom I gained firm control. But there was one boy who would not follow my commands, who would not do what I told him to, as the other boys did. His name was the same as mine, William Wilson, although he did not belong to my family in any way. He seemed to feel some love for me, and had entered the school the same day as I had. Many of the boys thought we were brothers, I soon discovered that we had been born on the same day, January 19th, 1809. Wilson continued his attempts to command me, while I continued my attempts to rule him. The strange thing is that, although I did not like him, I could not hate him. We had a battle nearly every day, it is true. In public, it would seem that I had been proved the stronger, but he seemed somehow able to make me feel that this was not true and that he himself was stronger. Nevertheless, we continued to talk to each other in a more or less friendly way. On a number of subjects we agreed very well. I sometimes thought that if we had met at another time and place, we might have become friends. It is not easy to explain my real feelings toward him. There was no love, and there was no fear. Yet I saw something to honor in him and I wanted to learn more about him. Anyone experienced in human nature will not need to be told that Wilson and I were always together. This strange appearance of friendship, although we were not friends, caused, no doubt, the strangeness of the battle between us. I tried to make the others laugh at him. I tried to give him pain while seeming to play a light-hearted game. My attempts were not always successful, even though my plans were well made. There was much about his character that simply could not be laughed at. I could find indeed but one weakness. Perhaps he had been born with it, or perhaps it had come from some illness. No one but me would have made any use of it against him. He was able to speak only in a very, very soft, low voice. This weakness I never failed to use in any way that was in my power. 
Wilson could fight back, and he did. There was one way he had of troubling me beyond measure. I had never liked my name. Too many other people had the same name. I would have rather had a name that was not so often heard. The words sickened me. When, on the day I arrived at the school, a second William Wilson came also, I felt angry with him for having the name. I knew I would have to hear the name each day a double number of times. The other William Wilson would always be near. The other boys often thought that my actions and my belongings were his, and his were mine. My anger grew stronger with every happening that showed that William Wilson and I were alike, in body or in mind. I had not then discovered the surprising fact that we were of the same age, but I saw that we were of the same height, and I saw that in form and in face we were also much the same. Nothing could trouble me more deeply, although I carefully tried to keep everyone from seeing it, than to hear anyone say anything about the likeness between us of mind, or of body, or of anything else. But in truth, I had no reason to believe that this likeness was ever noticed by our schoolfellows. He saw it, and as clearly as I, that I knew well. He discovered that in this likeness he could always find a way of troubling me. This proved the more than usual sharpness of his mind. His method, which was to increase the likeness between us, lay both in words and in actions and he followed his plan very well indeed. It was easy enough to have clothes like mine. He easily learned to walk and move as I did. His voice, of course, could not be as loud as mine, but he made his manner of speaking the same. How greatly this most careful picture of myself troubled me. I will not now attempt to tell. It seemed that I was the only one who noticed it, I was the only one who saw Wilson's strange and knowing smiles. Pleased with having produced in my heart the desired result, he seemed to laugh within himself and cared nothing that no one laughed with him. I have already spoken of how he seemed to think he was better and wiser than I. He would try to guide me. He would often try to stop me from doing things I had planned. He would tell me what I should and should not do. And he would do this not openly, but in a word or two in which I had to look for the meaning. As I grew older, I wanted less and less to listen to him. As it was, I could not be happy under his eyes that always watched me. Every day I showed more and more openly that I did not want to listen to anything he told me. I have said that in the first years when we were in school together, My feelings might easily have been turned into friendship, but in the later months, although he talked to me less often then, I almost hated him. Yet, let me be fair to him. I can remember no time when what he told me was not wiser than would be expected from one of his years. His sense of what was good or bad was sharper than my own. I might today be a better and happier man if I had more often done what he said. It was about the same period, if I remember rightly, that by chance he acted more openly than usual, and I discovered in his manner something that deeply interested me. Somehow he brought to mind pictures of my earliest years. I remembered, it seemed, things I could not have remembered. These pictures were wild, half-lighted, and not clear, but I felt that very long ago I must have known this person standing before me. This idea, however, passed as quickly as it had come. It was on this day that I had my last meeting at the school with this other, strange William Wilson. That night, when everyone was sleeping, I got out of bed, and with a light in my hand I went quietly through the house to Wilson's room. I had long been thinking of another of those plans to hurt him, with which I had until then had little success. It was my purpose now to begin to act according to this new plan. Having reached his room, I entered without a sound, leaving the light outside. I advanced a step and listened. He was asleep. I turned, took the light, and again went to the bed. I looked down upon his face. The coldness of ice filled my whole body. My knees trembled. 
My whole spirit was filled with horror. I moved the light nearer to his face. Was this, this the face of William Wilson? I saw indeed that it was, but I trembled as if with sickness as I imagined that it was not. What was there in his face to trouble me so? I looked, and my mind seemed to turn in circles in the rush of my thoughts. It was not like this, surely not like this, that he appeared in the daytime. The same name, the same body, the same day that we came to school. And then there was his use of my way of walking, my manner of speaking. Was it in truth humanly possible that what I now saw was the result, and the result only, of his continued efforts to be like me. Filled with wonder and fear, cold and trembling, I put out the light. In the quiet darkness, I went from his room, and without waiting one minute, I left that old school and never entered it again. I hope you enjoyed tonight's stories and that you'll join me for the conclusion of the story of William Wilson in the next episode. Don't forget to subscribe, share, and rate this podcast. Tonight's stories were written by Dylan Lowe and Edgar Allan Poe. The Dread Familiar was created by Joel Hackett. Thank you for listening. Good night.